My guest today is Philip Clayton. He, along with two fellow co-editors, uh, Jim Walters and Stephen Knapp, have put out a book most recently called Confronting the Predicament of Belief, which is a set of essays that respond to some very challenging uh, things provoked and raised by an original work, which was called The Predicament of Belief, put out several years ago. And uh, so we're excited to talk to you about both of those projects and how they kind of work together. So uh, thanks for coming on, Phil. Hey, thanks for having me, Christian. You bet. So not everyone would be comfortable. Uh, well, we should start by saying The Predicament of Belief was a fr pretty provocative book. Uh, you got some, uh, some interesting buzz just from how uh, much it pushed some boundaries. And why don't you kind of explain that a little bit? I have to say I find it amazing that the book would have turned out to be as shocking as it was. Because all we said was there are some real problems with Christian faith in today's world. It's just not so straightforward. And to see the vehemence of the responses was amazing. The one group, predictably, said, well, there can't be anything plausible about Christianity, so why would you even defend it anymore? Just let it go or take little morsels from the, from the collapse. The surprising response were how many more traditional Christians thought that beginning with reasons for doubt was unacceptable, mm. that you build the barricade of faith and that's all that you can work with, but to struggle with the reasons for doubt and trying to answer them can't be a part of Christian identity today. Mm. And so uh, in this new book, Confronting the Predicament of Belief, uh, you not only allow for a diversity of responses and even critiques of your existing work, but you actively work to give them a platform uh, to kind of, I wouldn't say dissect your work, but certainly press back against it. Uh, and then you and your co-editors offer some responses. You don't, it's not a Socratic debate format so much as it is just responding to those. And sometimes you uh, just concede that there is no satisfactory answer or truth with a big T. Yeah, because we found that the first book was so controversial, instead of pulling back, I think it actually radicalized us. And we thought, all right, if having a debate about the truth of basic Christian tenets is a problem, let's do a whole book, which is a debate. Mm -hmm. So let's lay it out there, every single claim that we made in this predicament of belief, and let's subject them to criticism. The whole book is a dialogue. It, it arose, actually arose out of a dialogue uh, of a, group, a bunch of people meeting and debating over a number of hours. And then we tried to keep that same feeling of fresh, open dialogue alive as we presented the book. And I, I actually had the pleasure of meeting this group uh, that generated your essays as I spoke to them at Loma Linda University. Um, and it consists, it's one of the most uh, theologically and intellectually diverse groups that I've ever met because there are some there who would be very devout Seventh-day Adventists, say, uh, and then you've also got it's effectively, I would argue, you know, secular humanists uh, who uh, are interested in the philosophy of Christianity, but not any metaphysical aspects of it at all. Uh, so how do you create a climate, which I think doing this within the group is also informative of how you created the book. Uh, how do you create a climate within a group that broadly uh, diverse, that sort of intellectual diaspora, uh, in which you can actually create some trust and meaningful substantive discussion? You know, the ancient Indian philosophers had this principle that when you were criticized, you weren't allowed to answer until you could restate the criticism sufficiently so the other guy said, yeah, you got my criticism. And we took that as the principle for these discussions. So when somebody would say, you haven't answered the problem of evil, God is still on the hook for evil in the world, then we'd say, okay, so we think this is your criticism. Is that right? <laughs> And, uh, and would, he, if he said, yeah, then we'd answer. When somebody said, um, you know, science doesn't indicate there's a God. In fact, science rules out any kind of ultimate spiritual being. We'd say, so we think your criticism is this. Is that right? And because the room was packed with scientists and philosophers and theologians, as well as lay people, we had a lot of people with probing questions. I hope that the spirit of that awake and exploratory debate comes through in the pages of the book. 
So in a way, although some would uh, uh, suggest that this is very postmodern in its structure, uh, because you are uh, the thing that you seem to be pushing uh, against more than anything is not some particular theology or interpretation of scripture, but this sort of modernist tendency to lean on certainty, uh, be that uh, the new atheist certain certainty or a fundamentalist Christian certainty. Uh, that at the heart of it is that, and and so in that way, it's also very ancient because of uh, the biblical tradition of midrash was all about arguing and 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 debating, and from that uh, would emerge multiple truths, multiple wisdoms that people people could juggle with and kind of arrive at their own conclusions. Yeah, what's cool about our day is that the ancient and the postmodern are overlapping. I don't think people have seen that quite enough. It it gives us a kind of permission in dialogue, and I would say a permission in our own faith stance that folks didn't have before. So we wanted to have a book that was about science and belief, doubts and belief, that didn't turn into a new fundamentalism. Modernist is to say, science is the platform, it's got to be built on that or it's hogwash. Modernist faith, sadly, said some sort of apologetic is the foundation, you build on that or it's hogwash. So I was brought up as an evangelical, and um, <clears throat> faith that demands a verdict, and the apologetic moves of the various evangelicals were absolutely basic. If you couldn't pass the bar of reason, then your Christian faith was in trouble. Unfortunately, everyone around me thought that all the Christian beliefs easily passed the bar of reason because we only talked to other Christians. Now we're, we've got a room full of scientists, non-believers, secular atheists, and when somebody says, here's a science argument, we don't have to say, I accept that as a foundation or I reject it as a foundation. We say faith is dialogical. Faith is the struggle between networks of plausibility. And you need to listen carefully to what has plausibility in your world and find a way to show that faith matches that level of acceptability without needing to be proven. It's a much more back and forth, open ended fabric than we've experienced before. Well, and and you bring up an interesting point just about our culture at this point, uh, in which we see an, an increasing dependence, I think, on these sort of self informing echo chambers, uh, in which we get into the sort of these self reinforcing feedback loops that that simply further entrench us in the ideology that we embrace and validate it rather than ever challenging us. So how, I mean... You know, Can, in, let me just jump in there, Christian. Sure. That's a really important point because what I see generally is that people who are 60 and above are in a demographic where they're happy to live in echo chambers and hear the echoes of their own voices. Or people way on the conservative end of the spectrum are happy to say, you know, I went to my Baptist high school and my Baptist college and everyone I know is Baptist and we all think the following arguments are good. But the vast majority of Americans are no longer in that place. And whether they call themselves Christian or post-Christian or Jewish or Muslim, there's, um, there's a faith which not only can but must live in a world without echo chambers, a world without boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so a kind of boundaried, walled-off faith is just no longer plausible. I actually think it's more like um, we talk about a centered set, something that draws people toward a center of meaning and of activity. And that's the kind of emerging Christian identity that we're looking for in this book. So you're not looking for uh, the perfection of truth, so to speak, or even to arrive at consensus, because you certainly still, if people are looking for resolution, they're going to be incredibly frustrated uh, with, this new, with this new book. But how do you uh, then, I mean, obviously this is a valuable tool for that kind of uh, of midrashic postmodern dialogue, but how do you get people pulled out of their insular kind of realities? Because although I understand, you know, people in their younger years now are more comfortable with pluralism and the coexistence of multiple truths, you still have this sort of culture of isolation in which we only connect through social media and such. So how do we draw people into a climate of trust uh, in which that love or trust for each other is greater than the differences that seem to be a threat. Right. 
two steps. The first one is to say that we actually seek a community of faith that encompasses difference. So we make it as, a, and for a lot of us that happens automatically. We make it as a principle that the people we come together to talk about faith matters are diverse. I mean, as I used to, to travel and meet with a number of emergent cohorts around the U.S., there would be somebody who was SBNRs, spiritual but not religious, and somebody who was clearly secular. Somebody said, I'm atheist and not budging. Somebody said, I'm a Buddhist and not budging. And only when there was that kind of complexity in the room did I really feel comfortable. And if everyone said, oh, well, you know, we're all neo-Calvinists or something, I wanted to turn and run. Right. So for the first thing is to value that diversity and to expect that the life of faith will be lived in that diversity. For many of us, that's already multi-religious. So in a sense, I would be creeped out by a room where everyone said, I'm clearly and emphatically Christian and I know my boundaries. When people say, you know, I'm, I'm Muslim or I'm drawn toward a Buddhist meditation, then there's the kind of complexity that I'd look for in a faith community. Then the second one is the discipline of admitting how good are your reasons and how great is your uncertainty. So in, the, in this series of books, but especially in Confronting, where we, where we engage in the dialogue from the ground up, um, we ask people to identify every statement along a spectrum from certainty, the kind of thing that you'd have in clear science, to um, I have no reason, this is a fiction or a story I like to tell. And just number them, if you will, you know, one through six. So uh, a lot of people say most of my faith is at six. It's, it's, um, it's a story that I find attractive, and I don't have any reason to think it's true. Or, you know, one step up might be, I'm, I hope I'm drawn to it, but again, I don't have any reason. It might be true, but, you know, I can't argue for it. And we actually believe that many of the crucial Christian ideas fall in the middle realms, call it three and four, right in the middle of the spectrum. Well, if you leave out the, the certainty claims and you're willing to say, we're hunting, we're, maybe there are arguments here, but probably nobody in the room really has a, a firm latch on truth, then it's a lot easier to build the trust that you're talking about, a lot easier to hear different opinions without feeling personally confronted, because you've admitted your uncertainty right at the outset. Well, and it's interesting that you lay it out in that way because that gives us kind of a, a meme to build on because I think in a lot of these challenging questions you bring up, like uh, did Jesus actually perform miracles? Was he physically, uh, you know, bodily resurrected? Uh, you take on theodicy, you know, the, the, uh, the, the power of God uh, versus the existence of evil in the world, things like this. And it seems that the most the debate that actually, or the the ethos that grabs the most attention, at least in in popular media, is that you have to be a one or a six. There is no middle ground in between. But it, it's kind of in that way. It's sort of like a lot of hot button issues in politics. Uh, you know, to try and distill down something like uh, you know uh, life or choice. You know, into an either or. When the reality is, a lot of people are somewhere in between with a lot more complexity. Uh, so in that way, it's kind of an in invitation. It's interesting you use the confronting uh, word, but it's really an in invitation into exploring uh, the predicament of believing anything. Yeah. I actually like uh, confronting. The idea is not that I'm attacking the other, but that I live in a case where the world confronts me as a religious person. And uh, instead of feeling defensive, I actually relish that position. There is more authenticity um, to be surrounded by those who don't understand this faith position that you have and together with them to discover what it means than to live behind the high walls. I, I won't do it. And a lot of us just have no interest in, in going back. What, something you said, Kristen, really interested me. Um, it's true that politics in America is sort of locked between the one and the six, the total certainty or apathy. And it would be amazing if people could say, why do I vote Democrat or Republican? Well, I was brought up that way. I'm not sure I have any good reasons. Mm. The moment you say that, you dial down the, the, the scale of animosity and you find yourself human to human 
with some inclinations to believe and a lot of understanding and openness about not knowing. Now, with Christian faith, what would happen if you took the parts of your belief and you asked, this is kind of a joke, but think about it. Uh, you put a number by each one. So that we confront some level of reality deeper than, you know, the trees and flowers and buildings around us. That's, that's pretty fundamental for me. I'll give it a two, right? Um, that, that the source of all things is not less than personal. It's not less than the kind of interaction that you and I are having now. I'll, I'll give that a three. You know, that's, that's still pretty far up there. That, um, that God is revealed in a unique way in Jesus. All right, so I'm drawn to that, but I don't think I have a reason that I could convince a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu that that's true. I'm, I got to say four. It's at the center of my being, but not out of rational certainty. It's, I say this more as testimony, can I say even as acculturation, than as, as certainty. Virgin birth, uh, you know, immaculate conception. I'm afraid I got to say six. I like the story. It brings tears to our eyes at Christmas, but I'm not making truth claims about it. Well, and it's interesting because it it, it uh, raises some, uh, maybe some necessary distinctions we need to make between uh, this sort of Western idea of uh, factuality and truth. Uh, you know, there there are things that we may claim fact about, uh, but then there are also things that we may believe are true, like does love exist? Well, that's not something I could prove, right? And so in some ways, it seems that you're offering people an opportunity to engage in a way that would seek that deeper truth without leaning so hard on their dependence on those, uh, whether or not something is factually, specifically accurate. Exactly. And what's irritatingly postmodern about this project, and I hope comes across in the book, is that... Um, irritates, it resists the kind of firm foundational skyscrapers on both sides. So the science guys want to say fact or baloney, right? Mm -hmm. For Richard Dawkins and the New Atheist. So if you, uh, Sam Harris, if you ground it in science, then now you've really got a certainty. If it isn't, then it's pure opinion, like whether you like chocolate or strawberry ice cream more. Okay. What irritates the skyscrapers of faith is that they want to draw a neat division between science and faith. So they say, oh, obviously, this is a, a matter of something hoped for and a conviction of something unseen. So who cares about reasons? And a kind of pride wells up. You know, we are comfortable in the fortress of faith. And a lot of us want to say, guys, it's not quite as comfortable as you think. This is an earthquake-prone zone. You've just built a skyscraper in San Francisco, and the big one is coming if it's not already here. Yeah. So we actually want the people on the faith side to get out of the skyscraper and come down onto the streets to recognize that, like the scientists, we've got to talk about pros and cons. We've got to deal with the reasons for doubt, that faith and doubt aren't opposites. And no building will keep you safe from the oceans of doubt. We got to be down there, you know, where the, where the water hits the mud and, and struggle through. That's the Jesus that attracts me. That's the kind of Christian existence in today's world that I think is worth holding on to. Well, that reminds me, uh, I believe it's an Anne Lamott who said that the opposite of doubt is not, uh, or the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of uh, faith is, uh, or certainty you know, that the, the antithesis of faith is certainty. Nice. Uh, and the day, that doubt is an essential part of the process of faith. But it's interesting because uh, in this way we can, you know, we can pick on uh, or we can push uh, and challenge the religious community because that's kind of where both of you and you and I come from. But there is this sort of uh, religious zeal kind of approach that you you touched on a little bit on the scientific side because really... One of the whole beauties, the elegance of the scientific method is, uh, I believe this for now, but there is always has to be an opportunity for it to be disproven and for the possibility of that. So there should never be a six in, uh, I mean, you know, Newton, we were pretty certain for a long time that his 
theories, uh, you know, of physics were correct, and even uh, Einstein. And now we're learning that there are nuances to that that we hadn't even considered uh, as we get more finely tuned. So it's a yeah, it is an invitation to all sides to to something maybe a little scarier at first, but much more rich and hopefully uh, more substantive in the end. Yeah, the scientist actually shouldn't be the one pushing back, because the the brilliant and nuanced scientists are quick to admit that some things haven't been falsified yet. So there are a couple centuries where Newton hadn't been falsified. Now we know Newton is false at speeds close to the speed of light, at scales uh, small, so quantum physics scales, and in, uh, and in high gravitational fields. So uh, Newton doesn't hold across the board. The scientist is supposed to say, uh, I hold on to it until I can falsify it, and I keep trying to falsify. Mm -hmm. The irony of the new atheists is that they uh, march under the banner of science, but they offer certainties. Richard Dawkins says, for example, um, faith is always evil, and deliberately into, to implant it into the mind of an innocent child is a grievous wrong. Mm. Listen to the words. Listen to the certainty just pouring out of there like molasses. Mm -hmm. uh, much more interesting are the people who have imbibed that spirit of open quest and who are interested in this question of meaning. You know, what do we live by? What, what do you hold in your hands when you contemplate death? The death of a relative, the, the agonies and the wrongs of life and the uncertainty of our planet's future, Right. And what we need are people who can say, we're caught be in a sort of pincher movement between the alleged certainties of science, the dogmatisms of the, of the conservative and the fundamentalists or the radical religious people around the world, and those of us who can live in that world of complexity, that world of uncertainty, who can learn from both sides, who can tolerate an, an enormous amount of ambiguity and then do constructive reflection for ourselves and those around us. Those are the people that we're calling out to in this book. And it, it is a compelling invitation, I think. And uh, I think anyone willing to uh, kind of give themselves over to the example that this book sets uh, will feel inspired and challenged by it, um, and even a little bit provoked, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so the book is Confronting the Predicament of Belief. It is a follow-up to the original volume, uh, The Predicament of Belief, and this is a collection of essays from a, a group of scholars, theologians, uh, medical practitioners, and lay people from uh, Loma Linda University. Uh, and it is a very thoughtful and very compelling, and I uh, am really appreciate Phil Clayton being uh, here to talk with us about it today. Hey, thanks for having me, Christian. 